All right, well, we'll go ahead and get the store started. So um, I want to welcome all of you tonight. Thanks for coming out and spending the evening with us. My name is Kevin Wilton. I'm the assistant curator here at the Rich Rock Queens Museum. And I've uh, been doing this for, well, doing that for Bonnie for about six months. She wanted some help with some of the things around here. So uh, I'm learning on the job, so to speak. So um, our talk tonight is going to be about the Castac Indians. So before I start to talk about them, does anyone know where Castac Lake is? Okay, all right. So uh, for all those of you who don't, Castac Lake, it's now called Tahone Lake. It's down here at the bottom of the valley across the freeway. Most of the time it's dry and that's normal. It's, it's generally a seasonal lake. And uh, a few years ago, uh, Tahone Ranch changed the name to Tahone Lake so that people wouldn't get it confused with Castake Lake down there, the reservoir south of us. But it's been there um, since the Pleistocene. It's, it's been here for a very long time. It normally dries up uh, during the summer, but there's, uh, springs there and i'll go into that a little bit more about the lake in a while here but the uh the castac indians so they were the easternmost part of the chumash tribe who lived along the coast the northern channel uh channel islands santa rosa santa cruz anacapa uh, ventura area uh, santa barbara up towards monterey and they, uh, it's believed they probably, their ancestors arrived here about 13,500 years ago. So I wanted to show on our, our first page of the handout, the, uh, the thoughts and theories about how people arrived in the new world for a very long time until recently was that they walked here during the last ice age from Siberia that there was uh, a gap in the ice and they came across from Siberia through Alaska and then down into America. But recently, through DNA and, and other things, they're finding out that there were probably some other routes for people to arrive in the new world. And the one we're gonna be talking about right now is this maritime route that went from the North Pacific, went along the uh, edge of the ice sheets and down along the west coast of North and South America. So about 13,500 years ago, people by boat followed what was known as the Kelp Highway. And this was a huge band of kelp that paralleled those, those shores that had been exposed by the water level of the oceans lowering during the Ice Age. And this huge band of kelp and the people going by boat and hunting these sea animals and progressively going east until they arrived at the New World. Uh, they were hunting seals, otters, um, fish, of course. Uh, a very large animal lived there until about the end of the 18th century. It was a relative of the manatee. And when Bering and his expedition came through there in the mid, um, 18, 1800s, I'm sorry, 1700s, they found these animals and they were up to 30 feet long. Uh, they were very docile and, so, and they were also full of meat and blubber. So they got wiped out pretty fast by Europeans exploring. But um, ancestors of the Chumash came down the coast, landed on Santa uh, Rosa and Santa Cruz Islands and settled there, continued with their maritime life until a few thousand years ago, it's believed that they started to run out of room on those islands. They had boats. We'll go ahead and turn to page two here. And in picture number two, you'll see one of their boats, it's called a Tomo. It's very much like a canoe. You see the paddles that they use are similar to those of a kayak. And these were made from redwood. So originally it was redwood that drifted down the coast. They would collect, but once they were able to make the boats, they would go ahead and paddle up the coast to try to harvest some more trees. But they, they built these boats. Uh, they would collect 
asphaltum or tar that is pretty common along that coast. Now you see all the oil derricks and rigs and things out there. They would collect the natural seepage and line the boats with those to make them a little bit more waterproof. So they were using these to paddle around, to hunt and fish, but eventually these, these islands became too crowded for them. So of course they were already going to the mainland there, Santa Barbara and Ventura to, to hunt. And uh, they began to migrate, but they have a, a, a legend. And it's this legend of the Rainbow Bridge that came from the islands over to the mainland. And so they believed that a goddess had created the bridge and they walked over to the mainland Unfortunately, some of them fell off the bridge, and when they landed in the ocean, they turned into dolphins. So uh, the dolphins were venerated by these people as, as being kindred spirits uh, of their ancestors that had lived there. So I just wanted to go to picture number four here. It's a map of the Chumash land, their territory, their tribal area. And up here in this corner, you'll see the little dot that says Castec. And that's where the village was located that we're going to be talking about tonight. So it's at the far eastern territory of the Chumash. Also, you'll see the islands here, and you'll see down here on this corner, the Santa Clara River that we know that flows from Ventura up into Santa Clarita getting the name from the Spanish, the Santa Clarita Valley. So, so people came to the mainland. They started, you know, they still had their marine life that they were hunting and, and fishing, but now they're starting to get other types of food. Deer, acorns. Acorns were probably the uh, number one food source of the California Indians. And so they were learning this from the other peoples that were already living in the area. Uh, groups started to go up the Santa Clara River and they were hunters and gatherers so they weren't farmers like many Indians or like the Aztecs were down in Mexico or the Mojave Indians over on the Colorado River they would go out and hunt and gather foods as they came into season and when they would ex exhaust a resource and area they would move on from there one thing that was uh, unique to this area is that we don't have any year-round rivers in this area. There's very little water. You'll have water in the winter. Most of it runs out to the ocean. Um, the mountains that we have here, this is called the Transverse Range. So these mountains, you'll notice if you look at a map of California, you'll have the Coastal Range that runs north and south, and you'll have the Sierras that run north and south. And then you've got all these mountains right here, and they all run east and west. And all of these were created by earthquakes and faults. And so they're, they've been pushed up, they've been turned. They're also very steep. And in the winter, the rains from the Pacific tend to hit them and run quickly right out of the ocean. And so you don't have any streams or rivers that are flowing all the time. So the people, when they migrated to the mainland, they were relying, as they were hunting and gathering, on these springs that they could find. Uh, there weren't any, very few lakes either. So um, they traveled up the Santa Clara River. Uh, they're hunting and gathering as they go along. They're relying on springs as, as they uh, migrate until they get to around the area of Magic Mountain. And there they find another tribe and they're called the Tatavians. The Tatavians are very different from them. They, they speak a completely different language. It's different it's from Chinese to German. And they didn't understand them, and they called them alikliks, which just means babblers. They're like, we're clueless, we haven't done it. We don't know what you guys are talking about. But they weren't necessarily enemies of each other. They, they were just different. But the Tatavians were already there. So they're going, all right, well, we're, we're kind of looking, bless you. We're looking around and, uh, they found a place called Sespe Creek. So it's not named on here, but if you go up the Santa Clara River, you'll see a, a river here near this, this eastern boundary. It runs north and then suddenly it turns west. So they went up this Sespe Creek. It, 
reaches the Santa Clara River about the area of Fillmore, and, and it's one of the last undammed um, rivers in California, so rivers and streams in California. So they they started to hunt and gather up this this Sespe Creek, and where it gets to this turn, almost a 90 degree turn, which is just south of us here, they reach a place called Johnson Ridge, and they also find some hot springs down there. So they're like, okay, this is pretty cool, but they decide to go up Johnson Ridge, and when they get to the top of Johnson Ridge, they're going up oh, almost 2,000 feet. We'll turn to picture number five here. And they reach this beautiful meadow, and this is Mutaw Flats. And they get up here, and this place is well watered, it's beautiful, there's lots of deer. And they go, wow, this is pretty cool. This, this is very different from where we've been. And you see these, this rock formation that's down here, out in, in Mutaw Flats. They start to paint these beautiful pictographs, pictures painted on the rocks there on this. And so, this becomes a, a very special place to them, very holy place to them. And they start to spread out from there. They go on, you know, there's all kinds of new food sources here. You know, this is different from being down in the Santa Clara River. There's stuff that we haven't learned about yet. And they start to go down the creek there, which is Piru Creek and Lockwood Creek, which is right down the road from us here. And as they work hunting and gathering, eventually they come out here to Cuddy Valley. And they're going, okay, this is pretty cool. They look up and they see this beautiful mountain, might have been snow capped at the time, that we know is Mount Pinos. But to them, when they go up there, they can see the island, Santa Rosa and, and Santa Cruz Islands out there in the Pacific on a clear day, their homeland. And so this becomes the center of their world. It's their holiest place because they can see all of their domain where they started and where they are now. And so they start to hunt and gather down the canyon here. And when they get down to the bottom of the valley here and they look across, let's imagine it's a springtime and they see this beautiful lake down there at the bottom. It's surrounded on three sides by mountains, maybe snow capped. And they're just going, oh my goodness, a lake and water. And they're going, let's go check this out. Let's, let's go build a village down here. So they go down, and you can see that here in picture number six. You can see the lake at the bottom, some of the Tehachapis with snow caps in the background. And right down here in the corner, uh, a place called Dryfield is where they build their, their little village. So uh, to kind of put this in perspective, I want to tell the story of the cast stack from the point before first contact. So before they met Spanish and Europeans. So we're gonna go back to about the year 1455. Okay, so the people have set their little village up down there and they don't know about metal. They don't know about all the things that, we've, that we're doing over in Europe or that we're doing in China and Asia. And so they're, they're, they're untouched and they're just living their lives. So um, they go ahead down in the corner down there. There's a little canyon. It's called Bear Trap Canyon. And in that, in that canyon, they find some year-round springs. And they're just going, okay, we've got a lake. We've got some springs. Um, we've got beautiful cottonwoods and cattails and willows are down in the lake. And they're going, okay, we've got water, we've got a place here that looks pretty, and we've got the materials to go ahead and build our home. So they build a village there. They use the, the cottonwoods to build a frame for their home. And then they use the reeds from the lake to cover it. And it probably looks something like this right behind you here. This is a, a replica of a Chumash home, and it's called an app, kind of like what you got on your phone, it's AP. So they build a cottonwood frame, and then they gather the reeds and make mats, and they put it around the outside, and it's fairly weatherproof. 
the the village there they name it Castac, and they become the Castac branch of the Chumash Indians, the easternmost branch of them. Uh, the village is called by some Kashtik. You might see that if you've studied any uh, of the Chumash, but for tonight's talk, we're going to go ahead and call I'm going to go ahead and call it Castac so we don't get it confused. Do we know anything about what that word meant to them or why they told them? That? We do. I, I'm going to cover that in a, in a little bit, yeah. So um, they go ahead and they build their, their homes there. There's a about a hundred people there. We know later, and I'll touch on that, but about 40 men and about 60 women and children there, which is fairly large village for an area. And it's a permanent village. Uh, the people aren't leaving here, you know, to go someplace else and never come back or just be here seasonally. They've gone ahead and make this as a, as a permanent place to stay. So before I go into that a little bit more, I'll talk about the social structure of the Chumash. So it was a, a stratified society. So they had three levels uh, of society. They had an upper, we'll just go upper, middle, and lower class. Uh, not people, but in terms of um, their caste and what they do. So we had at the other, upper part, the chief, who was called a Wat and his family, and also the shamans or shaman, who was their holy man, kind of their, their doctor medicine person. Uh, below them, your, your middle people would be your craftsmen and your hunters. We'll talk a little bit about the craftsmen in a little bit. And, and the lowest people would be your workers, the people who are hunting and gathering. Um, a lot of processing of the food, I'll talk about that in a little while also. Um, so talk about the Watt, hereditary. He was in control of all the resources of the village. He distributed everything, everything that was made, everything that was gathered. He would decide who got it, where it went to, that sort of thing. What was his hereditary? It was a Watt, W-O-T, yes. So he did that. He was also the judge of the village, if anyone had an infraction. He was their war leader, and he would also build alliances with other villages nearby. And I'll touch on that a little bit, it was very important. Underneath him, you have your shaman or shaman. He was the healer of the tribe. He would predict the weather, which being this close to the Pacific Ocean, and you got all this weather coming in. You also have the Mojave Desert and the Great Basin. So I know next week we're gonna have a a high over here and it's going to be very hot next week it's going to be really hot down on the valley so he's trying to give everybody an idea of what that's going to be like he's an astronomer he's checking out the stars he's going to let them know you know when's the equinox you know when we're not farmers but we kind of need to know when is the time to start to leave the village and go hunt and gather when are the plants going to be ready uh he's the counselor to the chief and he's also an artist and we'll we'll uh Look at some of the paintings that are in the area pretty soon. So a typical village, um, what we know from the Chumash along the coast, it might have been very typical of this village also. You had a, a gaming field. Uh, people would run and they would play games and chase each other and do things like that. There was also a ceremonial spot of the tribe. And this was called Amala Malam to Poopy, bit of a mouthful for me, but this was for the chief and the shaman and the upper people. It was generally enclosed with some mats, with a mat wall. So what they were doing in there was kind of secret. The other people just kind of, you know, they hear drums and chanting and stuff going on in there and they're going, okay, well, there's something very important going on. We're going to find out what it is in a while. So, um, you have your work areas. Work areas, processing your food, making trade goods. And we'll talk about that in a bit. A shrine. So unfortunately, we don't know what the shrine might have looked like, but up here in Lake of the Woods, Bonnie found there was a place called the Shrine Tree. It's no longer there, but the Chumash and, and other peoples would go there 
and they would leave offerings. They might leave some skins or they might leave something of valuable to them and it was an offering for better hunting later in the year. So perhaps they had a shrine down there that was a tree or a rock or something they considered sacred to themselves. A sweat house called a Temescal. So they would go in there and, you know, get, get warm, perhaps talk, um, perhaps like a sauna. Um, I don't know, and I'll tell you if I don't know some of these things, but I don't know if this was only for the men or if it was only for the women. But um, they did have that. They did have a hut that was for women when they were menstruating. So they would leave the village and go there. So they were away from everybody until that, that time was, was over. A cemetery for the village. So there was a professor named David Jennings. He and a group of students from Bakersfield College did do um, a study of the area back in 1978. It's pretty much the only excavation and dig over there. And uh, they did find at that time the work areas, they found the, the Temescal sweat house, and they found the cemetery. So unfortunately, being on Tejon Ranch, there hasn't been opportunities to go and, and look at this. There were a few times when a new road was being dug and they might backhoe part of the area where the village was located. And he was called like, hey, you know, you wanna come see what's in the trench? So he would get a chance to go over there and do that. He uh, also was able to go out to the lake. So talking about the lake, it's a, a saline lake because it dries up quite frequently. There's, um, Anecdotal evidence that I found from people that worked on the property on Tejon Ranch that even though it would dry up in the center of where the lake was, it was generally still wet uh, all year round. Uh, possible, probable that there were fish that stayed in there and then when the lake filled up again from winter rains and snow came back up, the fish would go out and breed again. And, uh, and come out. So the people were not drinking from the lake, but they had year round springs where the village was. And also the area of where the northbound rest stop is now on the I-5. There were cottonwoods there and there were springs there that ran year round. What we know of the springs is that the 1952 earthquake kind of shifted things over there and it caused all those springs to dry up. So, as far as we know, they were always running until quite recently over there. Were they on the east side of the lake? They were on the east side of the lake, yes. Uh, they're in, in Bear Trap Canyon, and also there where the, the rest stop is um, right now. And of course, things have changed a bit with the lake and when it fills up. Oftentimes, it would get so much water, it would overflow and go down Grapevine Canyon that we know as, as Tejon Pass now and flow all the way down to the valley floor. Other times it completely dried up except for this little little wet spot on the middle there. So these apps, the homes that were there, because there were about 100 people there, probably 10 to 12 apps. Generally they were family units that lived in these, so 10 to 12 people per unit. Um, they had these, let me get back to the picture here. So on page, picture number seven, you're seeing a picture of the village. You can see the apps here. Some of the, the people in their work area, they would put poles up and put reeds or branches over it to stay in the shade. Uh, you can see the lake in the background. They would build these reed boats kind of like papyra boats that you'll see on the Nile and other places in South America, like, like uh, Titicaca. Um, they go out there and fish and hunt. And then picture number eight and number nine here. This is actually over there in the, la in the area of the village. So picture number eight, they would gather acorns 
was the, the number one food source that they had. Uh, about 2,000 pounds of acorns per person per year. So, I mean, an incredible amount of, of acorns. And they would go ahead and build these stone caches. And they're found all over in that area where the village is. They'd find a big rock. They'd pile larger rocks in front. They'd put the acorns in there. They would line it with white sage that's found around here, which is kind of a natural insect repellent repels uh, squirrels pretty pretty effectively not 100 percent but they would uh, put those in there and they would dump their acorns in there and then put rocks over to keep the critters from getting in and then here in number nine you'll see a picture of one of the work areas where they would grind the acorns so the uh the acorns very abundant but they have a, a tannin in them that makes them bitter to the taste so it's not a poison but you want to get rid of that before you eat it so what they would do is they would go ahead and, and crush these in these holes or with a, a mono and matate here so they would take the acorns crush them into a meal put the meal in a bowl with water and they would just keep changing the water and leaching that tannin out of the acorns until it didn't have that bad taste anymore. So in that picture number nine, that's what you're seeing is those holes where instead of having these, of course they had these when they left the village to hunt and gather, but, but these were ones that were right there at the village. Do you know, did, they, did they crush the acorn whole or did they break it open and you would break the shell open and, and then get the, the nut, the meat out of it, yeah, and then crush that up. So the uh, the apps that they lived in, you had a central hearth inside for fire and for warmth, for cooking, and you also had uh, mats that they would sleep in. So I mentioned the reed boats, bless you. And uh, they had their work areas. So the work areas in the village, they would process the food, obviously. Uh, they would create tools and weapons. Um, shells, they would process olivella shells, and I'll talk about that, bless you, in a little bit. Uh, they would create trade items there. So necklaces, ochre, which is a type of mineral that is, um, is red. We'll have a picture of that here soon. Uh, ceremonial clothing because um, from feathers because the lake was uh, on the migratory route of uh, birds like ducks and geese and cranes. And so they had this opportunity to uh, catch and kill these animals, not only for food, but they would gather all these feathers that they would then make ceremonial garments out of and fetishes, things that the shaman would, would have. Perhaps have some feathers, maybe a rattle or something that they would use in their ceremonies for the gods. So I uh, just want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, foods that they had. So the major plant foods that they had, of course, acorns, I've talked a little bit about that. The village itself was the highest permanent occupied village of the Chumash in all of their territory. So it was at an elevation of 3,511 feet. So they were just below what's a normal snow line for us living up here. They might get a little bit of snow, would melt very quickly, but it wasn't too cold that they had to go back down to the valleys where it was warmer for the winter. So they've, they've got that there. So it gave them access to a lot of other food sources up here. So the pinion nuts from the pinion pines, juniper berries, uh, chia sage up here, the uh, chia, and it's starting to bloom out here right now. When the seeds were ready, they would take a large basket like this. They would go up and knock the seeds off into the basket and collect it. And then they were able to go ahead and mash that up to use for food also. Manzanita berries, grapes and raisins. Of course, this is Tahoon Pass now. The original Tahoon Pass is east of here. So this was Cañada de las Uves, which was Grapevine Canyon. So. All these wild grapes that grew up and down the five here 
during the time that they were there. Elderberries and cattails that grew around the lake. So cattails, of course, roots and the pollen from the, the head stems and everything that they used for food. Those were their major plant foods. Uh, other things, minor plant foods, you'll probably see it in the spring um, over here underneath the oak trees but will be miner's lettuce. Uh, dandelions, of course, you can eat. Sunflowers, uh, bladder pods. So not normally thought of as food for all of California Indians, but lots and lots of bladder pods, especially out along uh, Gorman Post Road where the sag ponds are. I'll talk about that a little bit. So they would go ahead and not eat the pod itself, but inside the, the seeds, they would gather those and roast those. Wild rose, uh, prickly pear pads and fruit, uh, Indian tea for its seeds and drink, and yucca. So the, the yucca fruit, the flowers were edible, but the fruit itself could be taken and mashed and made like a sweet meal they could add to the acorns and junipers and pinion nuts and make a little bit tastier meal uh, for dinner. Um, medicinal plants in the area. So willows, of course, grow up and down the, the stream beds here. So uh, pain reliever, uh, good for fevers, cuts, burns, stings. Uh, Indian tea is kind of a, a stimulant, but also was a good decongestant. Um, nettles, so singing nettles, we probably might have touched some of those a few times, but when they're dried out and used as an anti-inflammatory, it's good for arthritis. And uh, Indian paintbrush, which grows here. So also good for arthritis, could be crushed up and put in water as a hair wash. It's good for getting rid of lice. And um, it also had a garlic taste they would add to food as well. So in number, picture number 10, we got some of the fishing equipment. So there weren't a lot of fish in the lake. There was a type of perch that lived in the lake. It's similar to a type that lives in the Sacramento Delta. It's now, of course, extinct in this area. Um, sucker fish were there. And besides the lake, they would go out along Piru Creek. So lots of sucker fish and minnows and things out there in the creek. Um, let me go ahead and turn to picture 10 and 11 here. I'm going to, as the crow flies, probably eight miles or 10 miles. They would have yeah. walked, yes. Right. Yes. There's actually studies on that where the one guy, I forget, uh, maybe it was, uh, I forget his name, uh, King maybe. I think he did all these routes and they guesstimated times between all these areas. It's pretty interesting to get yeah. time for something like that. That's a good read. What's his name? Uh, I, think, I think Chester King's name was on his Yeah. Yes, so um, talking a little bit about Piru Creek. It's going to be a little bit ahead, but I'll talk about it now. So there, the tribal or resource area of the village was from the lake here, Pastoria Canyon, which is just a little bit east of it, and all the way to Piru Creek. So basically from about the area of the five freeway over west to Lockwood Valley, Utah Flats, this area out here, Mount Pinos, Mount Abel, also known as, as uh, Cerro Nonoreste. Um, Takuya Ridge here was their northern boundary. The streams and canyons on the other side, San Emilio Canyon, uh, Plato Creek, all of those were part of their territory, and Cuddy Valley right here. So from here to Piru Creek, a little bit down Piru Gorge as far as Templin Highway. And so that area, they start to encounter the Tatavians live in the Castake area some mingling of the peoples there. Um, but this was basically their hunting gathering area right around here, mostly on the other side of Fraser Mountain and out Lockwood Valley and Cuddy Valley right here. So deer, they would disguise themselves as deer, usually hunting in pairs to go after the deer. Uh, ducks out on the lake, they would take poles with string 
they would tie an acorn to the bottom of the string and set it just under the water with a stick and the ducks would come swimming along or other birds come swimming along and see the acorn down there and stick their necks down to grab it and there would be a noose that would spring the trigger and pull the ducks up and duck it's what's for dinner tonight so yeah yeah so um besides besides those um also a lot of quail and doves that they would would kill um the tool they might use is this So this is a, it's called a rabbit stick, and you'll notice it's carved down kind of like a wing, so it's a, it's a non-returning boomerang, and you know, you got little peters over there, or the quail are running around, and you take this back and get a good aim, and you throw it, and it's got a spinning kind of flat trajectory, and you bat them, and then pick it up, and now it's a very nice club, too. And uh, so besides duck, maybe you're having some quail or rabbit for dinner tonight. So, uh, antelope. So there are antelope in the area over there. This is one time that they found that the Chumash or the Castec did use fire. So they learned this from the Yoku Indians that live in the Central Valley here, just over the mountains. And the Yokuts taught them to build enclosures and then they would light fires and try to drive the antelope into these enclosures where they could then kill the antelope for, for food. And also elk. So there's uh, the Thule Elk Preserve just over the mountains and also over, over at Windwolves. So they learned about the elk over there and they would do combined hunts with the Yokut Indians. So no, the fire would drive drive them, oh, at you know, toward a certain like area, that. you know, kind of it's a like box a box something. canyon kind of idea. Yeah. So, um, <coughs> so the the village was uh, their base village. They would stay there during the winter and into early spring, living off all the food that they collected the year before, and then <laughs> in in that time, early summer. They would break up into these small family groups of 10 to 12 people and they would start to go out. They would, as I said, they would go out in Hungry Valley, over 31 different camp sites that have been identified out there that were just temporary hunting and gathering spots. Um, camps here in the park, also in Lake of the Woods, also out Lockwood Valley, Lockwood Creek, that area. Um, the shamans would leave the village and go up to their holy sacred sites like Mount Pinos and San Emilio Canyon and Plato Creek where they would do their, their paintings and stuff. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the council of different tribes. So there was a, a small coalition of villages and it was Castec, which was Chumash. Also some Yokuts that lived at the south end of the valley. Kitanamuk that live over here just on the other side of the freeway in the Tehachapi Mountains, and also some Tatavians from down here in Santa Clarita. They had a very loose coalition together, and they would meet, and what we know for sure is that they met for defense. So they would pick a time of the year to get together, all the chiefs, and uh, talk about that. Um, the Mojave Indians would come over from the Colorado River. So generally, uh, late winter, spring, when the desert was was cool and there was still some water out there, they would suddenly show up. Uh, sag ponds. Does anyone know what the sag ponds are? Or where they are? Yes. 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 So a sag pond is a spot on a fault, where as the fault moves it'll form these depressions and the depressions will fill with water and 
we're sitting right on the San Andreas Fault here. So you've got sag ponds. Um, you have them up where the clubhouse is right now in Pine Mountain Club is a sag pond. Lake of the Woods up in Cuddy Valley. Um, you've got over here, um, the lake itself was a sag pond. Lake Hughes, Lake Elizabeth, Lake Palmdale, all along the fault here. And these would fill with water during winter or springs or snow. And people would travel using these to go back and forth. So lots of sag ponds that were, were used. So in picture number 13 and 14, just a generalized picture of trade that took place in the area. You'll see trading coming from across the Mojave Desert and all the way across over here to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, Castec is in the general area over here. And you'll see a spot out here where it seems like in, everything intersects out here in the desert. That was where all these trails did, and it's now a place called Barstow. So still an intersection, the five and the, I'm sorry, the 15 and the, the 40 out there. Uh, in ancient times, this was the Indian path from the Colorado River to the Pacific Ocean and back over there for trade. And then in picture, <coughs> excuse me, number 14, you'll see the village of Castec right here. And you'll see the four different tribal areas that intersect here. The Yokuts in the south end of the San Joaquin Valley, the Katanamak over here in the, um, the Hatchby Mountains, the Tavians down here in Santa Clarita, the Chumash here out to the coast. At the very bottom, you'll see the Tongva. And these were the people that lived down in Los Angeles and Catalina Island. And so a little bit out of this area, but there was trade that was going on. The uh, Mojave would come across. The Mojave were farmers. So they did grow crops. They would travel across the desert to trade here. Uh, they would bring corn and beans to trade. And so besides just living here at the village, this was a trading post, a, a trading um, kind of like the ball of this area because all these tribes would go there to trade from different places and from long places far away. And uh, when the Spanish came through in 1806, they went to the village and, and they, they quoted that the people there were altogether too cunning and crafty. You, they just, you know, they were used to dealing with the Venetians and the Italians and the great trading people and the Silk Road. And now they find these guys and they're just going, you know, we just can't get anything over on these guys. So um, it left an impression on them. Um, one thing that they did trade, it was kind of neat. It was Olivella shells. So these were um, gathered by the Chumash along the coast. They were uh, put into necklaces. The necklaces were money. This was the money that was like a universal type of currency for all the Indians of the area and all the way out to the Mojave Desert. And the Chumash had monopoly in all this stuff. So the people at Castec were able to get some of the shells. They would then work these into these bead necklaces. And that's what they used to trade. A certain size or a certain color of necklace was worth a certain thing. So um, let's see here. So when we had this uh, this little archaeological expedition over there in 1978, we'll turn to, to number 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. So I got a page here full of trade goods. So I'll just go through some of these. These were things that were traded or found to be traded at the village. So number 15, this is ochre, which is a type of um, mineral that was used for pigments and for painting uh, pictographs. Um, a lot of this was found down along Refugio Beach also Tahunga Canyon, Santa Susana Pass, down where Simi Valley is, all the way out in the Mojave Desert. So those were brought here and processed. Uh, number, I went to the heat passes here. 
Number 16 is a tar cake. So this is natural seepage. This might have come from the coast or from Towsley Canyon down in Santa Clarita or Hopper Canyon, which is out by Piru or Mettler up here at the south end of the San, uh, San Joaquin Valley. And they would use this tar to waterproof their baskets. They would also chew it like gum. They didn't know that this was poisonous and not good, but it's what they, they did. So this was a huge trading item because the Chumash didn't have pottery. Um, they had beautiful baskets, but they weren't always waterproof. So they would waterproof their baskets so they could use them to hold things. Uh, the next item, number 17, this is uh, a steatite bowl, also known as soapstone. And there's only one location that this is found, this type of rock. It's Catalina Island. So they found this uh, parts of these bowls over here at the village of Castac. So stone or uh, manufactured bowls from the Tongva out on the island were brought all the way up here and they were used to make bowls. One of the neat things besides um, it coming from there, it's very easy to carve. You can carve it with stone tools and other rocks. You can also put it in fire like you could with a metal pot or bowl and you can boil and cook food out of this. And so incredibly useful item. They would also carve pipes. They did smoke tobacco and use it for rituals. So they would carve this soapstone to make pipes to use for that. Number 18, these are some of these uh, Olivella shell beads. And they would process some of these uh, different sizes, different colors. Um, number 19, now this is pottery. And they found lots of broken pottery over here at the village. And this was traded. So the California Indians did not use uh, pottery, but they might have traded with the Mojave besides beans and corn to get some pottery um, to use for cooking. And then down in number 20, these are some of the artifacts that were found over at the village during the dig. So you'll see pieces of chart and um, other stone that they used for tools and weapons. Some of the olivella that they're going to go ahead and drill to make holes out of. Uh, they found lots of obsidian over there. There's no obsidian in this area. So the nearest obsidian, they would have traded with the Mojave Indians to travel out the 40, you know, across the desert to Needles to heading east. You'll see all the volcanic rock out there and everything. And there's lots of, um, lots of that stone that's, that's found out there, obsidian that they would trade. might have used obsidian, might have used some of the chart. Very labor intensive. So the food production, the manufacture of all these goods, very labor intensive. And so besides the food that they're, get, they're gathering just to live, they're also producing all of this stuff for trade over there. Let's see. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the language of the people here. So it was, they had their own dialect. And it, of course it was a Chumash dialect, but later after the Spanish came and started the missions, they moved many of the people along the coast, including most of the Chumash into the missions where they were mixed, different clans, different tribes, different peoples, and their, their languages became mixed. The people here at Castec were never under the mission system. So they had almost a pure Chumash dialect. And um, so some of the words that we know of, uh, one is a word called Saluki. And what's um, neat about this word is the, the legend about Tahone Pass. So the, the Spanish word for Tejon means badger. And the original Tejon Pass was east of here. And the story was that there were some Spanish going down there and they found a dead badger. And they said, okay, it's Badger Pass. But 
the Chumash Lacastec word what a Zaluki was badger and they were known as the badger people so it's thought by many academics and scholars that the Spanish nice story but the Spanish may have just adopted that the badger people for the badger pass uh, another one is uh, Casacama, which is home of the jackrabbit. So Libre Mountain over here above 138, the three points, that area um, known as, as uh, Jackrabbit Mountain. Another word that they think might have been translated from Chumash to Spanish, and now it's Libre Mountain, uh, you know, Jackrabbit Mountain. Um, you were asking about Castec or what, what the meaning might be. So they had um, Sasa was the name they had for the lake. And it could mean a spring or a lake, but it was mostly interpreted because they didn't have mirrors because the Spanish hadn't shown up. So their idea of a reflection was the eye. So it means an eye in a face. So when they saw the lake, especially when it would start to dry a little bit, the salinity of the water, the white color, it was the eye and the face of the sky. And that was their, their meaning for that. They did have a lot of loan words. There was the Tatavians down in the Castaic area. And so that south end down the five, there was some mixing of peoples and mixing of the words there of that area. Um, We'll go ahead and go to number um, picture number 21 and 22. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the spiritual beliefs of the people in this area and the Chumash generally. So they believe that there were three layers, three levels of the world, an upper, middle, and lower level. The upper level was the sun, the moon, and the stars, and they were held up in the heavens by a giant condor's wings. And so you'll see that flying there, an invisible condor to them, but it was the only way they could explain things hanging up there. Um, the middle part, the, the middle world, is where life existed. So we're in the middle world right here. But underneath of that middle world were two large serpents that were sleeping. And every once in a while, they kind of stir and bump each other in their sleep and the ground would do one of these things. So that was how they explained earthquakes happening, and especially in this area, which was, was known more for that. Um, Mount Pinos, as I was, was saying, is the center of their world. So they believe everybody else was around here. We're in the, in the middle, kind of the Middle Ages belief that the earth was the center of the universe and the sun revolved around us. This was their, their center of the world, and they could see their home islands out there in the distance. Another thing um, was their lower world. So the lower world you see there uh, covered in clouds. Um, they believed that spirits lived there, that the dead went there, and that the nighttime is when the spirits would come out and roam. And so at night, they were all in their little app around their fire, not going out because you didn't know what was walking around out there. Um, rattlesnakes. They venerated rap rattlesnakes. So they were sacred to them. Not sure all of their beliefs, but that was one that they didn't kill the rattlesnakes. Effigy stones. So... Um, there's been these stones that have been found in Chumash area. Uh, one that was found out in Utah Flats was shaped like a fish, carved like a fish. And these were to bring good luck. So they might carve a stone like a fish or they might carve something, you know, like another animal to give them luck in, in hunting. Um, Jimson weed. So not a food, but something that grows. It has uh, hallucinogenic properties. Um, not recommended that anybody go out and pick this and see what they can find out but the shamans would 
use some of this Jimson weed to see visions and, and commune with uh, the stars and the moon and see, you know, what might happen. What's the weather going to be like? What's, what's going on? So pictographs uh, and picture number two, you see the shaman and he's standing in the valley here and that's Mount Pinos in the distance. So he's venerating the mountain of his home of the Chumash homeland. And then in picture number 23 and 24, you see some of these beautiful pictographs in the area. The, the meaning of these is not known. Um, the Chumash were um, brought into the mission system by the Spanish and a lot of their beliefs have been lost. Some of what has been retained, they keep to themselves. It's not something that we're going to share with people who are outside of the tribe. So we're not <laughs> sure what some of this means. The top picture, is, this beautiful picture is in San Emilio Canyon, some of the caves over there. Uh, the bottom picture is from Piru Creek, Upper Piru Creek. It's thought that the, the large image in the middle is giving birth, but we can't be sure. It, it's speculation for us in this modern age. But these were found all over this area. So San Emilio Canyon, caves over there, Plato Creek, um, out here in Piru Creek, other areas of Chumash area. Sir, I think you were talking about the Painted Cave out here in the Santa Barbara area. So other Chumash areas with with uh, paintings out, out there. So um, that was some of the art. The shamans would take the red ochre and other colors of ochre that they traded and they would paint these out there. Uh, we'll go to number 25, 26, and 27. So we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, threats and conflicts in the area. So, yes, we have bears in the area, but this is not your average black bear. This is a grizzly bear. So, yeah, they did live in this area. Um, just north of the village where Tahone, Port Tahon is now, when the first explorers came through, they were like, my God, there were grizzly bears everywhere there. Uh, feeding off the acorns and also skulls of grizzly bears. It's not known if the Native Americans were the ones that killed the skulls or previous explorers had done it, but uh, huge grizzly bears. Of course, our mountain lion friends that we still have around here. And the bottom picture, jaguars. So the word jaguars in here, the Spanish recorded them they were probably wiped out by the Spanish and American um, settlers. They were fairly common on Takuya Ridge in the north side here. Also small cats, ocelots, were found in this area. So things that were common here for the Castac in 1455, but no longer here. Um, going to 28, 29, 30, and 31. So conflict. So the top picture 28, this is a picture of the Mojave Indians. Uh, they would travel to trade from the Colorado River area, but they would also come to raid this area. Uh, there was a site down in Sespe Creek area called Henley Flats. They found a massacre that occurred down there in the past that they believe was the Mojave Indians killing the Chumash of that area. Um, they were known as clubbers because they had these wooden clubs that was their main weapon. Um, it had a ball on the end of it, rather like a, a soft ball, rather large. They would use the club to swing and crush and break the jaw and then grab it with two hands when, the, when their victim went down and then smash their heads with it and they were known to walk hundreds of miles across the desert carrying chia seeds and going from these sag ponds across. They would trade through here. They would trade with the Castac Indians. They would go all the way to the coast 
to trade for these shells, but sometimes they would come through and they didn't want to barter. They just wanted like warfare anywhere. They wanted to take something that belonged to somebody else. So was it a rock at the end of the boat? It was uh, wood. Wood. Wood, yes, yes. So in picture 29, you see some of the Chumash weapons. Um, they used a bow that was about three feet long. Uh, arrows that were made from Thule reeds. Uh, number 30, some of these obsidian um, arrowheads. And obsidian, incredibly sharp, sharper than surgical steel. In fact, there's some surgeons that use knives that are obsidian in their surgery. Uh, picture number 31 is an ambush of raiders. So they would often come through the canyons. I was talking about that coalition. So we do know just after this period, about eight, 1790, there was a group of Spanish soldiers that came up San Emilio Pass. And of course, they're entering the Castec in area. They're also coming through the Yokuts. And so there was this coalition of villages here and they got together about 39 warriors from the village of Castac and then the Yokuts, Katanamuk, the, and um, their neighbors, and they all got together and they ambushed the Spanish over here in the pass. And they killed two of the Spanish soldiers. Um, the Spanish didn't write if they lost the battle or won the battle. They didn't say they won it, so you can kind of assume they probably didn't win the battle and they didn't say how many Native Americans were killed either. But it was a sizable force that, that went there to fight them and they got them in one of these little canyons firing down on them with bows and arrows and rolling rocks down onto them so i'm going to Let's see here so yes yeah, so i do want to talk about some of the unique beauty of where they live so picture number 32 and 33 so you know, they started out on the islands. They worked their way as hunter-gatherers inland up the Santa Clara River, up into the mountains, finding new food sources and, and land for resources, other peoples and everything. And then they find this beautiful lake down there. And again, you, you see where their, their home is. It was right here, just above the lake. You'll see a little tan spot. I'm, I apologize for the picture not being the greatest, but that was dry field. That's where the village area was. And so they're looking up at the Gorman Hills surrounding them there. They're looking at the snow-capped hills behind them. And then in the spring, before they went out to start to do their, their summer hunting and gathering, you look at the, the wildflowers blooming on the Gorman Hills there. And of course, living up here, we'll see them around there as well. So just an absolutely beautiful place to live. So many resources and things for them to, um, just a really wonderful life in this area. So uh, yeah, once again, just to recap a little, um, a year round water source, which wasn't available everywhere else. Uh, highest permanent Chumash village in their their tribal area. Large variety of foods, uh, plants and animals for food. It's near the spiritual center of the Chumash world, Mount Pinos. Um, they've got their own dialect here. Uh, it's a trading hub for four different tribes and even people as far away as the Colorado River and the coast. Um, all these different trading paths meeting here and an incredibly beautiful location for them to live. So, just wanted you to think about that. Think about the people that lived here. Some of what they share with us is a really nice place to live. The beauty that we have here, these mountains, sometimes with snow, sometimes with wildflowers, um, a bit isolated, but worth being here and, and living here. So um, I want to thank you all. That, that's what I wanted to share with you tonight. I hope you enjoyed it all. And thank you all for coming out, spending a Saturday night 
at the museum. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This, we well, we know from, yeah, I'm sorry, if, if anyone has any questions, and I will have some things up here to share if you want to come up, but I just wanted to get the, the, the talk portion out. The dig dated it to 1455. They were not able to date before that point. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking about that time. The Tatavians are believed to have come down from Northern California and arrived in the Santa Clarita area about 1000 AD. So they may have been coming up the river about that time, met them and then started moving into the mountains and then slowly working their way through and then finding the lake and, and uh, establishing their village there. Of course, the Spanish show up um, in the New World, 1492, but they, they weren't really in California until the mission uh, system was, was started, which was about 1767, I believe, 67, 69, is when Father Sarah started building the missions along the coast. Probably at least 300 years. About 300 years, yeah. They, they had it all to themselves up there. Um, so was there a population that grew during that time, or was there so much danger that a lot of children who were born didn't survive? And yeah, the mortality rate was probably pretty high. Um, but from the types of plants, I mean, you think about the things they have. So willows for headaches, decongestants, uh, things for arthritis, um, uh, Indian paintbrush for cramps, things like that. So not a vast amount of medical knowledge that we have, but not bad, you know, not bad. Um, we just don't know that much about the Chumash before contact because their culture was mostly wiped out with the Europeans. Yes. Oh, sorry, I thought you had something to say. Yes, so, um, yes. You talk about the Chumash people and how they were born into those traditions or were they voted into? They were hereditary positions, so... They gotta start someplace to be hereditary. Yeah, at some, <laughs> at some point in time, the people went from just becoming, being hunters and gatherers, to being larger groups and establishing the chief, chieftains and chieftainships, you know, um, going up the political ladder, starting to grow a little bit. Uh, they're not up to democracy or Greece or anything, you know. Um, in ancient times, but they're they're starting to get these hereditary positions of the chief's family. Now, I don't know if necessarily the chief and his oldest son was the next chief, or if it was someone within the tribe—a brother, an uncle, children, something like that. But the chief would pick his successor. But the chief would pick his successor, and probably the shamans came the same way, hereditary, because they're passing down this knowledge that they're trying to keep just to them, this religious knowledge. Although, in, in studying for this, and, and almost all of this is from our archives that we have here at the museum, there was another Chumash village west of here on the Sisquoc River, and it was said that the whole village were witches, meaning everybody there was a shaman. And the other Chumash were just absolutely afraid of these people. They, they didn't understand how they had all this different knowledge and they could practice these different arts and everything, and they were afraid of them. They just didn't go over there. They didn't want to have anything to do with them. So um, something for more research, something else to try to find out about. Um, I do have a few items here. Um, some different types of, of food. So all of this is stuff that I gathered the last couple days, just going up and down the roads here. So just in cut from um, Lebec up to Lake of the Woods, all of these things found. So acorns, 
We have uh, pinion pine nuts, juniper berries, manzanita, chia sage, which is blooming right now. Um, getting, some of it's starting to turn brown, but in this, this elevation, it's white right now. Elderberry, this is actually off our elderberry tree right over here on the corner. Um, wild grape. So I've got a grape leaf. Uh, the grapes, this is actually from our wild grape bush around the corner of the museum also. No miners uh, lettuce? I look, we generally have miners lettuce growing in the shade under the trees. Yes, and it, Yeah, so I was looking yesterday and it's just dried out and it's, it's blown away for the season. But yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we get some under the carport. You know, generally any place that it's shady up here, you know, in the spring. Um, sunflowers, obviously. Um, dandelions, good, yeah. A weed and also a food. Um, wild rose, I found this just out Lockwood Valley Road before the ranger station over there. So a couple little roses still left. Um, here's some of those bladder pods. And every time we do a ridge route tour and we're going out Gorman Post Road and we'll have five, five stops or so out there. And these things are growing all over the place and people are always going, what are those goofy looking things? Looks like plastic and they kind of feel plastic too, but it's bladder pod. And they've got the, the little seeds in there that they would open these up and, and, uh, and eat those. Let's see, what else do we have here? What did I miss? Okay, we've got those. Oh, let's go with let's go with medicine. So we've got some uh, some willow, of course headaches. You know, willow, a uh, white willow bark is where you get aspirin from, and uh, some Indian tea here. So this was a good decongestant. This I actually picked from our Indian tea plant, also over here by underneath the elderberry in the corner. Also Mormon tea, yes, yes, a ephedra. So not the, the Chinese ephedra like you get in Sudafed or something like that. So stimulant, um, you, know, you can, if you're out backpacking and stuff and you forgot the coffee, you can always, if you find some of this, you can put in some warm water and use that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yucca, obviously, some food and tools, cordage, you know, string holds the world together. So got some of that. Uh, what's that? And duct tape. And duct tape, yes. <laughs> uh, some pinion pine sap. So, um, heating. You could heat some of this. You mix it with some charcoal out of your fire, and it makes a great glue. So, you can go ahead and take your obsidian arrowhead and, and tie some of your yucca string on there, and then you melt some of this and put it on there and let it harden, and you've got your arrowhead. Is, is tied on there really good. Another neat thing about um, yucca is the needles. So you can bite right behind the needle carefully and pull it out and you'll get the needle with the string attached that then you can sew with. Oh, let's see here, um, oak galls. So I just picked these up right over here. So this is caused by uh, a wasp it, it gets into the tree and it forms these things and they'll oftentimes drop, but they would crush these things up and make a powder and they would take that powder and that's what they use for tattoos. Yes. And the Mojave were well known for all of their tattoos. You might, some of you might've seen the picture of the, uh, the woman with the tattoos on her chin. It was, was an American girl who was kidnapped by the Mojave and they tattooed her and they, they might have used some the of them. The picture you had of the three people with the three Mojave, yes. were those all tattoos on them? Yes. Or, or, okay. Yes, they were. I, I did have, I did actually have in one of my books photographs of the Mojave. Um, I wanted to keep it uh, PG. So, <laughs> but yeah, they would tattoo their whole bodies and especially the women, uh, heavily tattooed. Um, let's see, this is one I put in a quart, heavy quart zippy, nettles, stinging nettles. 
So yeah, when I was picking these, even with gloves, they got me a little bit through there. So cordage, very good cordage, and uh, also medicine. Uh, some obsidian, I've got a few pieces here of obsidian that we have at the museum. Uh, stone scraper. So one, one thing I didn't bring out, but we do have on display inside of the museum is, a, is two collections of arrowheads that were brought to the museum by a person, who, a resident of the area that collected these from Chumash hunting sites right here in our area. He had to suddenly move back to Maryland and said, I can't take everything with the museum like to have these. And so we've got them in there. Um, actually only one obsidian arrowhead. Um, everything else is just made from local stone around here. They would pick it up. Very small arrowheads. You might think, oh, you know, that's for a bird. But no, if you get close to a deer with, with the arrow and you get a vital, vital shot, you can bring down a deer with one of these small arrowheads. Uh, let's see what we got here. Oh, this, you might have seen this uh, blooming just probably a month or so ago. The beautiful plants with the yellow going up and down the highway here. This is called Fremontia, and it's another item for cordage. Um, got really great. I peeled some of it back here. String for tying things together. Um, this is a gourd canteen that might have been used by the Mojave traveling across the desert. They grew gourds over there. We've got um, some white sage. So has anybody heard of smudging? Okay, yeah, smudging. So they would take the white sage and bundle it up and they would light this and pass it around. It was thought to um, drive away evil spirits. In many cultures, evil spirits are equal to insects and pests. So the same thing, it keeps the bugs away, it keeps the evil spirits away. Um, they would bundle this and hang it inside of their app. I've hung some inside this last uh, spring. I've got a willow basket in there. I collected some acorns uh, last fall and I put uh, some white sage in there. And up until the invasion of the squirrel people, now for probably about eight months, all the acorns were still in there. And then all of a sudden they're just like, they might've gotten some raccoons to help them out to get in there. But uh, yeah, the white sage was, was very, very effective. Um, hand drill for starting fires. So they would use that. Um, again, the mono and matate, this was found in the area. We just had somebody come in a short while ago with two beautiful grinding stones. Yeah, I was out in my backyard and I was, you know, getting ready for June 1st, trying to get the brush cleared and look what I found, two beautiful grinding stones out there. So you, you never know um, what you're gonna find. Of course, our, our little little friends, and we got these running around. Is it, that a, the taxidermy quail, or is it just? A this is a toy. A toy. Yeah, <laughs> he, he did he did squeak when I when I when I yeah, but um, he he looks cute. I like to bring him out. Yeah, I actually got this at the uh, Chumash Museum down in Thousand Oaks. So yeah, mentioning that that's it's if you ever get a chance, go down there and check out. You know, we want you to visit our museum but also check out their museum down there because they've got some beautiful displays. They've got a whole Tomo, the Chumash boat in there, which is about 30, 40 feet long. They've got scenes that looks like you're standing on the beach with the Chumash and they've got their fishing nets and they've got a seal that they're harvesting and, and fish. Yeah, they've got, which I, I'm jealous, they've got a diorama of a Chumash in the cave painting all of this stuff and it says San Emilio Canyon just up the road our Castec Chumash here and they've got them down there in Thousand Oaks so I would love someday to do more with our Chumash area here maybe have our own little thing with with some of the stuff 
um, that our Castec people did here in the area. Yeah, so, um, what am I forgetting? Oh yeah, rabbit skin, skin, dinner, um, Don Pedro Beges, Beges, uh, Spanish explorer, came in with the Portola expedition and Father Sarah. He and Father Sarah didn't get along very well. Um, he later went on to become Spanish governor twice of California when it was uh, a Spanish province. Um, he wrote about his travels as a young captain through this area of California. And he talked about the people that he saw. And one of the things he talked about was their clothing. So uh, men and women, uh, loincloths, but men and women also bare breasted. And uh, they called the villages rancherias for Spanish. A lot of the names that we have for the Chumash are Spanish names. So um, the San Emilio branch here, San Emilio Mountains, named after St. Amigius, because the Spanish would often name things on whatever saint day it was when they found something, met somebody, did something, and, and uh, they would, would name it that way. So um, we have that. We have them to thank for that. So um, any other, any questions, any other questions?